Today on Gun Talk Nation, Phil Strader with Sig Sauer. His first assignment when he joined Sig was working on the P365. So you're going to hear a little behind the scenes history on what happened. Gun Talk Nation is brought to you by Savage Arms. All right, welcome into Gun Talk Nation. Today on Gun Talk Nation, we got one of our good buddies here, Phil Strader from Sig Sauer. Phil, welcome in. Thank you. All right, Phil, um, what is it that you do for Sig Sauer? <laughs> what is it, would you say, that, <laughs> that you, you do, do here? here? <laughs> okay, Bob. Um, I actually was just recently, well, I started out as product manager. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually, Sig called me uh, right after I was uh, released from Remington when they they closed, they shut down the defense division. Sig called and offered me the position of uh, polymer pistol product manager. Um, very specific. Yeah, well, the 320 was uh, brand new. Mm -hmm. um, it had just been released uh, in SHOT Show about a year and a half before that. And they, um, you know, they knew it was going to be a big thing. They had gotten a lot of sales. And um, they, the guy that was working on it, he, uh, you know, he just, he wanted to do other things. And, uh, you know, of course, I took the job. It was, it, you know, they read the description and what I would be doing and the experience I would need. And it, and it really perfectly matched up with what I is a good done. fit. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. Um, it, you know, they wanted uh, some shooting background. So you needed to know the product. Um, they needed a little bit of business background. And I had done that. With and so you ought, to, you ought to give people like a little context here because it's like, oh, I work at SIG and I'm, you know, product manager. And now you're director of I'm director of uh, firearms product management as okay. a whole. So all the all the gun side of SIG. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think it's important to note like your background and how you got here. Um, how long is this puck? <laughs> yeah, no, we don't need a whole dissertation, no, but yeah. I well, mean, competitive shooter, yeah. um, doing law enforcement stuff, doing training stuff. I mean, talk just a, a minute for that. <clears throat> One minute. All right, <laughs> go. So here we go. Uh, well, when I graduated, I graduated from college. I went to UNC, got out, went right into law enforcement. Um, I, I had this notion of I wanted to be in the Secret Service. I don't know why. I don't know why that was. It Secret was agent. Weird. Yeah. The guys, maybe it was the sunglasses and the <laughs> and the talking to the earpiece. I don't know. Men in Black had just come out. I guess. And it was, it was know, a crazy in the line time. Of fire. In the line of fire had just come <laughs> out, I think. I, I came out the year I graduated, 93, I think. But that, it'd be that as it may. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I got a job as a police officer at my local agent. Am I boring you? No, I'm, I'm making sure that my phone's not going to go off. I just forgot to, I realized I forgot to turn it off. Amateur hour here before you start a podcast. Turn <sighs> yeah, off I put phone. my phone and vibrate and put it over there. So what do you it's mean? Cause so distract me. Uh, you know, that's why I like working with professionals, Phil. Well, you're a good guy. <laughs> but getting back, I was a police officer for a few years at my, the, uh, the city that I kind of grew up in and I moved on to the Capitol police. And oddly enough, it was because the Capitol police was the only federal agency that would accept applicants with eye surgery. I had, uh, I was bl basically legally blind my, most of my really? life. Yeah. And, uh, I had many surgeries on my left eye to start, um, three to be exact. So I have like on my left eye, I have 24 scars on my cornea, so it's not good. Whoa. And uh, then I flew to Canada to have this eye done. So by the time my eyes were finished and ready to go, um, the Secret Service, the FBI, the DEA, all the big agencies said, uh, we're not accepting uh, people with eye surgery anymore. No, thanks. No. So, wow. and they all kind of went that route and Capitol Police was pretty much the last agency standing. And um, so that's where I applied just to get into the system because I thought maybe they would relax their standards, which they did. Um, and as I got more into that system and and got to the Capitol Police and yeah, I wasn't on I wasn't on detail for very long. I was maybe two years and I went straight into the firearms training unit um, because of my background in shooting. And that's kind of where it led me into the Capitol. And then by the time I got into that and got deep into the, the training aspect of it, I realized I did not want to be a Secret Service agent because then I knew people that did it and I saw the job and I was like, that's not more. what they depict on television. That's a <laughs> lot worse. So uh, yeah. you were, were you doing competitive shooting before you got into law enforcement? I was, yeah. I, I went to an indoor shooting range in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I, I didn't know anything about IPSC or IPSC as they called it mm -hmm. at the time. I just shot fast and I was good at it. I don't know why or how. Mm -hmm. I just, it was something I was good at. And, or I mean, good 
for comparatively. I mean, I didn't, I got my butt kicked in my first match, but so I went to a range and I'm shooting really fast. At, of course, like we all do, we put the target at comfortable distance and shoot really fast and the hits are okay. Yeah. You know, most, mostly good hits. Yeah. yeah. I just, you just <laughs> described, I just described 95% of most range sessions. <laughs> Out, yeah, in, indoor ranges. But so I did that and the, the owner was there. I was the only person in the range. It was like a Tuesday afternoon or something. And he gave me this flyer on a piece of paper. And I'm old. You know, this is a long time ago. He said, you should try this thing, this Ipsic thing. And so I called uh, Jeff Hogue. Um, he was the um, section coordinator for that area. And I started shooting and I shot my first match and fell in love with it in 1994, I think. Joined immediately. And I didn't shoot again. I, I mean, my, my job with the local department I was with at the time. It, uh, you know, it didn't lend itself well to competitive shooting. I worked all the weekends. So I, right. between the times of 94 to 97, when I went to Capitol Police, I may have shot seven matches total, but I loved it. You know, I knew I was going to love it. So I guess and I and that's why that. I want to give the background, because like <clears throat> there are people who work in the gun industry who have various other hobbies, right? Or, or various other experiences. But I mean, it seems like you were pretty well suited because you, you had the law enforcement side of it and kind of and that whole side, but also competitive shooter mm -hmm. side and you've won, uh, yeah. competitive I'm shooting. Okay. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I yeah, Phil, Phil, look guys, <clears throat> let's be honest here. Apparently Phil oh, shows up and does way better than he should. That's yeah. fact. That's a fact. Like people are like, so you've been training like, ah, no. Nah. Yeah. Not well, look, I, I didn't make a lot of money. I was I <laughs> my first job with Cap uh, for, with the Ample Police Department. I made I think I made eighteen thousand seven hundred dollars, and when I went to Capital, you know, I was I was up all the way up to twenty six thousand. So it's, you didn't make a lot of money. So I didn't have a lot of. It takes a lot of money to shoot and to practice and to get that ammo. And I didn't have that luxury, so I just did a lot of dry fire. You yeah, know? and that was kind of what got me where I was. I mean, but in 97, you know, I started reloading a little bit best I could. I was scrounging bullets and brass and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, loading when I could. And from 97 to 2000, I was really getting after it. I was, I was dry firing every day. I was shooting as many club matches as I could scrounge ammo to shoot. And I would shoot, you know, maybe two or three, four majors a year. I did shoot my first nationals in 98. And after that, I never missed one. The only nationals I've missed since 1998 has been uh, because my wife got hurt and had to have surgery. And uh, my first year as president of USPSA, I, I took that year off to focus on the match to, to running it. Yeah. And uh, but otherwise, I've shot 68, 68 nationals. Wow. Total. I've shot more nationals. than I didn't think you're that old. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I am, but I'm not because I shoot every division. I shoot three gun our multi gun division production, carry optics, open, limited, limited 10, um, everything. Single stack. I shoot every single division. The only wow. division I haven't shot a nationals in is PCC and revolver. I was going to say revolver. Yeah. No, that's I was, a whole I different. Actually, I had a revolver built to shoot the nationals and something happened and I couldn't do it. That, do it the year. It was the year Rob Latham won nationals and I was supposed to go that year to shoot revolver. But so I've shot a lot um, I, and I've done very, very well. I don't I can't explain why uh, I had a very strong work ethic and then it's just just a natural thing. So I, I, I had that background, the shooting background because of. I, I just fell in love with it and, and just my whole life has revolved around the sport. All right. So shooting. we'll go off on a little bit of a tangent here because it's just a curiosity of mine. OK. Um, so you you kind of said you had sort of a natural natural ability with shooting mm -hmm. and you kind of just did your did your thing. What you thought was the right thing to do, just some doing some dry fire and shoot as much as you can. Do you find that it's hard to tell people to teach people how to get better at shooting when you kind of came at it as like, I don't know, I just know how to do this. Uh, it, it, I, that was the first thing I thought when I started teaching, uh, well, my, honestly, my first teaching was police officers, mm -hmm. right? I was, uh, I was a law enforcement instructor. I wasn't doing a lot of competitive shooting. Um, so th it didn't really matter for that because cops don't shoot competitively. Typically back it's a then, different they didn't. thing, totally different thing. Yeah. Defensive shooting is a lot different than, uh, than competitive shooting. So yeah, you're, you're not wrong, but as I started competing more, and getting from look people people take classes to either be become uh, to learn about shooting because they've never shot before and they're they're very very new or they take classes to get better at shooting and those were the two things that i i was pretty good at was brand new shooters teaching them how to the the, the basics you know the how to just be able to shoot a target and hit it mm -hmm. um but also i was i was able to teach people how i got better but I could also apply that to drills that they could do to get better. Because let's face it, 
competitive shooting is basically having confidence in the ability to hit a shot when you need to every single time. And then the mechanics of it, moving into position, out of position, shooting on the move, uh, setting up in position, all these things were very easy to teach because all you're really teaching is a skill. You're teaching that skill. And I was able to to kind of invent all these drills that I could do to keep people, how to teach people how to keep their gun up high when they're moving into a position. And I would just basically s- segregate those drills into their own little thing. And then we would put it all together on a stage. I was always really good at seeing people shoot. And this is what part of my classes when I was teaching. This is part of it was I'd film everyone, shoot the stage. Uh, we'd set up stages, I'd film them, and then I would critique them based on what I saw. And then I would review the film like a week later and hmm. send them back a copy of me voicing over what they had done right and wrong and how they could improve. That's and interesting. So I was, uh, this was in, gosh, uh, 2000, early, um, early mid 2000s when I was doing this. So it was, it was at the time, it was kind of cutting edge stuff. Now I think everybody's doing video review and they have all these yeah. programs that do it. But um, I was doing it on kids a, with it. I was doing it on a Windows <laughs> Movie Maker. I was just trying to put all the pieces together. It was wow, it was horrible. But so yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It, that was my biggest concern. Was how I can't. I, I can't expect that I'm going to have a bunch of people in there who are just naturals and know how to do it. But yeah. I can show them the program that I used to to get where I got by with basically what I call it low cost practice. I could show them my blueprints of success through dry fire because to me that's the most important part of learning the mechanics, the draw, the reload, that kind of thing. Which is funny because here we are again where people are looking for low cost practice options and they're scrounging bullets for reloading and right. all that stuff because there's scarcity among ammo and also ammo's expensive these mm-hmm. days. Um do you have is there a drill that comes to mind that that's like this is kind of a go-to that you that you really like or you know people like that you you've taught? Um there is. I I actually um I used to be the pro tip instructor for shooting USA a, a long time ago. I used to, when I shot for Smith and Wesson and I put a lot of those drills into that um into that segment. And one of the ones I teach that are shooting related and it, it, it tires you out more than you shoot a lot. It's a simple drill on how to keep your gun up in position because one of the biggest problems that shooters have is they'll, you know, USPSA and IP, IPSC, IDPA, it's all about, you know, moving around, you know, mm-hmm. moving into position, moving out of position. And usually when someone moves into a shooting position, they'll move in and their gun won't be ready to go. It'll it's be low. Kind of, it'll be low and it won't okay. be high. So there was a drill that I used to do that I would set up a, a, about a six or eight foot t- wide wall that you couldn't see around. And I would force shooters or students to keep the gun up in front of them all the way extended and teach them how to drive the gun to the next position and have the gun basically pull them into position. So the gun was I was forcing them to keep the gun up, which is a very hard drill to do when you're used to dr- breaking your arms to take off to run. Sure. So that was a great one. Um, that one. That was probably one of the better pro tip segments we did uh, that made the most sense. But as that was as far as our live fire training goes, as far as dry firing goes, I had a list. I had a piece of paper that had everything down to the draw, down to the reloads. Uh, I even did movement positions, moving in and out of position while dry firing. Um, but it was it, I wouldn't say one was more important than the other. It was just a matter of what you wanted to learn. If you want to learn the draw, there was a whole section in there to do the draw and then you had to do 10 perfect ones in a row to move on to, the to next move on. Thing. I mean, like you said, you were disciplined to get there and you kind of had a plan in place. My plan was based on no salary and minimal, <laughs> uh, minimal assets to be able to get there. I just had to necessity breeds invention or something like that. Yeah, um, all right. We're going to be right back after this quick break. Smith & Wesson's newest gun is the CSX, and this is not a new M&P pistol. This is a whole new gun, and it's a metal gun, which is number one, different, not polymer. All metal, but it's 12 plus one capacity, has a flat face trigger, and they've done some other things to kind of modernize this and make this a carry gun that you'll like carrying. It's small. It's compact, but because it's a metal gun, it's hammer fired. Um, it's a it's a fun shooting gun. So check out the new Smith and Wesson CSX. Also, Savage, the new Savage pistol is the Stance, and it comes in a variety of 
flavors, as I would put it. Um, you can get it in different colors. You can get it with different sight systems, um, whether that's a laser or three dot. You can get a gray. You can get it FDE. You can get it all black. Check it out. Savage Stance. So, Phil, we got to talk about SIG. I mean, one of the first projects you worked at at SIG is probably still one of the most popular guns that you guys sell, the P365. And when this gun came out, I had heard about it. I was It was described to me months before I saw the gun mm -hmm. um, from working with SIG marketing folks and all that. And I was like, sounds neat. I don't know. And then when it showed up, honestly, everybody at the Gun Talk office was like, wow. That's that's a small carry gun. And then we do the same thing to every single one of them. And guess how many rounds this gun holds? Right. And it was it kind of changed the way you thought about things. I mean, what's the backstory on how you guys got there and to go cuz you really had to you had to go it's going to it's going to be this small and it's going to fit this many rounds and probably people go, "Well, that's against the laws of physics. Like you can't, <laughs> you you can't occupy that much space with all that stuff. I mean, right. what's how did you get there? Well, you know, polymer offered a lot of opportunities there. You know, good polymer, the right glass uh, uh, and mixture, and uh, and it was able to give us a grip or a wall of a grip was really 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 thin. I actually have uh, well now the the current polymer pistol. Uh, product manager has in his desk one of the original prototypes of the uh, it was you know fast prototype grip mm -hmm. gun everything polymer and but when you take the magazine out it's it's a single stack oh wow so uh in, in the infancy of the gun it was before before i got there the 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 intent was just to have a a gun to co compete directly with the with a glock 43 you know okay a, a sure small thin micro compact nine millimeter but as uh, as we started looking at the grip and the contours of it and the fact that it felt a lot better, it didn't feel like this crazy, like holding a ruler mm -hmm. like thinness. Mm -hmm. It felt good and solid. And we had a lot of wall thickness in that in that grip module. So we said maybe we could fit a double stack magazine in there or something similar that, you know, kind of thins us out at the top. And it's not. I wouldn't say it was not new technology. There are gun companies that have done that. If you ever look at an STI mag, you know, they're really fat and they, they narrow down to a super thin neck at the top. Right. And I was like, oh, there's no reason we couldn't do that with a smaller magazine. Maybe not that extreme, but um, and that that was kind of the direction the product product went. It all went to, OK, let's do let's do what other companies are doing. We'll do it better and we'll offer more ammo. So we wanted a gun with a better trigger. We wanted better sights. Um, we wanted better ergonomics because let's face it, the gun just feels better. And it doesn't feel like the other guns, they felt like they were being designed for a very specific purpose to make them super thin without uh, giving, you know, an account to how it's going to feel in your hand. Yeah. Um, I carried a Glock 43. I carried a Car P9. I carried uh, an M&P Shield. I've carried a lot of guns. Um, and they did what they had to do. Kind of in the, uh, all in that category of micro nines that are single stack. Right. right. They did what they had to do, but they were never comfortable to either carry, hold, or shoot. Because mm -hmm. they were either too snappy. The car was awful to shoot. The trigger, a lot of people didn't like the, the, tr the triggers on the cars because they're double action. The Glock felt horrible to hold and, and wasn't very fun to shoot. The M&P Shield was actually not bad, uh, but it was big. You know, it was much bigger than I wanted to carry. So... The idea was to, the idea honestly became, what kind of gun can we make that I would want to carry? What is my version of the ideal carry gun? And it's not a lot different than everyone else's version of the perfect carry gun. It, they want the smallest gun they can carry that doesn't recoil too much, and it feels good to, to hold, and, and it's small. And mm -hmm. it holds more ammo. And yeah. More is better. And, you know, that was where the whole seriously campaign came from is, you know, people could not believe it. That was the first thing people were holding. They'd hold the first prototype and I say, yeah, that holds 11 rounds. And I'm like, seriously, that would yeah. say that and I was like, we can make something. We, you know, we could do something. Seriously? So we actually put that into our our first ad campaign was 10 plus one. Seriously. And that's what and and from there it was a snowball effect. And we knew I mean, we knew we had something special. Um and that's why we kept it so protected and so close to the chest. And we, we played that one pretty safe. We actually brought in um, uh, writers beforehand and gave them a sneak peek. We brought in our customers 
you know, our our, our uh, v- big vendors showed them the gun beforehand, so they knew, okay, this is going to be a big thing. Right. So we were that confident about it, and you know, we were right, and and we also knew that we were going to be about a year ahead of the competition. You know, we knew that no one had done this and no one had ever thought of it because there was never a need. The need had always been filled by other gun companies with a single stack six or yeah. seven round magazine. Yeah. And we thought, well, why not just make a new need, create a new market? And that's what the 365 did. And then, you know, we didn't stop. We didn't slow down. I mean, think of any other gun company that came out with a, a, such an impactful carry pistol and then follows it up a year later with a an X series model with optic readiness and all that. We, mm-hmm. we were that excited about it that we knew we're onto something here. And this could be a family of guns, you know, the 365 family. And we're still expanding on it with the Spectre comp we did. Yep. We, you know, we, we wanted to, we had new, a new gun, a new take, a new basically level of, of performance that had, we had created. So we wanted to create something new and do a compensator that no one ever done. What better platform to do that on than the 365? And I know we've put out a video about this, but I mean, we've been, we were shooting it yesterday at the range. We're doing some filming. And, and what's interesting is when a gun is released and especially for us, we release a video about it. And then we want to see, we're trying to anticipate when we do these videos, what are people going to ask and what are their concerns going to be? And then it's interesting to see the comments of what they actually, and a lot of people are critical of the comp because it's not a traditional comp. So, I mean, right. you're, you're the, you're one of the guys behind this. I mean, explain what it is and how it works and that it actually does work. It actually does right. something. Cause a lot of people are going, it's not going to redirect enough gases to make a difference. Well, there, that's not terrible. It's not exactly correct. Uh, is a, what we did is basically we incorporated, we ended the, the barrel of a, we took a 3.7 inch slide, a mm-hmm. 365 XL slide, an XL slide, and we put a 3.1 inch barrel in it, like a traditional, traditional barrel, um, and then length of a P365. Correct. Yeah. And at, but when that, where that barrel ended, we ported the slide. We actually put the, the ports or the compensator built it into the slide. Now, the end of the slide uh, has to, the hole has to be a little bit bigger, obviously, to accommodate for the tilt of the barrel as the slide goes to the rear, but the fact of the matter is is the gases are still coming out of the end of the barrel and still ex- escaping through yes the end of the gun but also through the ports so the compensator or the slide integrated expansion chamber compensator whatever you want to call it it does work now would it work as well as if i were to say let's just attach a, a similarly sized two port compensator directly to the barrel what does it work as well on paper no it doesn't work as well now as far as on the range it works as well because you can't feel that what two three percent difference you're going to feel okay in recoil so you can a study it and see that oh, you it'd be a difference put it on a slow mo and see that it's gonna it recoils maybe uh, a, a a compensator in the slide recoils maybe one or two three percent more but you're not going to be able to see that under the the speed of recoil so it didn't make sense to do two things a you're introducing extra weight to the end of the barrel and right. it, it's going to create it does create problems it creates uh reliability concerns and it also creates a longer gun because if you think about this a 3.1 inch barrel that's threaded Mm -hmm. has to become to for it to work with anything other than a comp if you want to make maybe let's say we want to put a a threaded barrel in our in our 365 to make it work with anything else like a suppressor the barrel is going to have to be at least 3.6 just under 3.6 inches long to accommodate for the extra right you know threads now you're going to put a two port comp on top of that and it's got to attach to the thread. So now you're adding another half an inch or more to the end of the gun. So now you've got a 365 instead of a 3.7 inch barrel or 3.7 inch upper, you've now got a four to 4.1 inch upper. It's and bigger now, than the, than the 365 XL and it won't fit bigger. those holsters. You lose holster compatibility. You now have a longer, bigger gun. And at that point, the whole point of the compensator was to reduce the recoil of this 20 ounce pistol. Well, <laughs> now that you've gotten a beer gun, why wouldn't you have just bought like a X compact right. or something like that to accommodate? So we wanted to keep the size as small as we could give us some mit- some recoil mitigation. Yeah. And maybe it doesn't work on, on paper the same as a barrel uh, compensator was, but we know it mitigates the recoil almost up to 30%, depending on what kind of ammo you use. You use okay. hotter ammo, you get more recoil right. mitigation because yeah. there's more gas shooting out of the top of it. So it will give you better recoil mitigation. 
it's a nine millimeter for first off. It's not recoiling that much. And we didn't want to sacrifice size and, and concealability and holster compatibility. So we had the ability to do all this in one gun. It only made sense to do it, like I said, on a 365 because that's kind of a trend setting, you know, pistol. And I think it's going to do well. Everyone seems to be very excited about it. I think when they get the gun in their hand and they shoot it, they're like, oh, wow, this does recoil less. So, yeah, it's very flat shooting. Um, and I think when it comes to carry guns and just your carry setup, I've always, uh, everything's a compromise to me. Of course. Like, I mean, you'd carry a big, full size, double stack gun or or, or something even bigger than that if you could all the time. But like practically, right. you're not going to do that on your everyday carry. That that key part of it being right. everyday, wearing it what, no matter what the weather, whatever you're wearing. So I think it's always a compromise. And, um, you know, the concealability part, all that stuff. So, I mean, you guys kind of, I guess, address that. And obviously, and, and I think you guys, hopefully people listening are going... Oh, they've had like a lot of meetings about this. It's not yes. just well, like, yeah, oh, let's cut, a, throwing let's, darts at the board. let's cut some holes in the top of that slide. Hey, you spin that uh, wheel and we'll see what it lands <laughs> on. Uh, oh, yeah, that'll work. We'll do, uh, I don't know, compensator in the slide. Never heard of it. No, yeah, we, we do think these things through. <laughs> um, and the goal was to make a platform that was very popular. The 365 XL mm -hmm. has been one of our most popular platforms and to give it less recoil and that was the goal and to be able to do it in a way that was more elegant um a little bit better looking we should talk about that because it is a specter gun so there are other things beyond just the comp which is it's kind of that's the really new interesting different part of it but you did some other stuff to the gun too oh yeah it's a specter so it's got the titanium nitride gold barrel and gold trigger we actually uh laser engraved the grip module on all four sides so that's kind of a, a nice treatment you look online and find people doing that for anywhere from 150 to 200 dollars. it's crazy our our texture came out so good i was crazy impressed with that um and of course it's a specter slide so it's custom works marked it comes with all the custom work stuff and the we changed the slide completely we did the serrations a little bit different it has this crazy like like falling sun uh, or all rising sun pattern and it's got lightning cuts in it so if you think about what you would have to pay to get your grip module redone your trigger and your barrel code and some people love the gold some people don't you know i get it but you know we're, we're attracting tough. a very it's we're attracting a very specific group of shooters that's this gotta be tough when program. you're trying to pick out like okay we can't offer this in 28 colors right. um you know it'd be nice production wise it just probably doesn't make sense but it's funny you mention that because look if we could we could just say hey why don't we try a titanium blue barrel listen every single thing we do and this is one thing people don't understand about sig and it's the biggest thing overlooked about our company and, and you know it'd be really cool to do kind of a, a Mythbusters episode where they actually come into our company and see how we test things. But every single change we make to a gun, whether it be a, even as something as simple as a barrel color, that now gets tested to the nth degree. To really? the point of ridiculousness to where it, it took me, me, it took us so long to, to finally nail down this barrel finish because we were testing them to death we were i mean we we're checking everything not only just the durability of it but the thickness of the finish and how it affects the the hardness of the barrel if the barrel hardness became too close or not something outside of our specification which is crazy high by the way our mm -hmm. barrels are the hardest barrels in the market um we we'd have to go back to the drawing board so we had a finish and and but it turned out because of the way they were heat treat, heating up the barrels to get the finish on it uh the, the the hardness was falling beyond what we were happy with and so we went right back to the drawing board you we guys test are, everything yeah. re it's, we're an engineering company i was about to, to say start. you're we you engineer. guys the, at the top level um is run by engineering minded people and you have I don't know how many engineers on staff. I know it's a lot, a lot these days. Um, and you're, and it's kind of, you can hear that. And I'm, I am not an engineer minded person. And it almost, it's like, like you said, we, we tested to ridiculousness where like, even internally you're like, well, yeah, we need to test it. But like, is it, is this Ugh, necessary? Yeah. Like, it, oh my gosh. It's a constant <laughs> budding of the heads between me. I, I, you know, it's, it's twofold, right? I really want to launch the gun. I want to get the guns out there and let the people see it. But I, on the other side, I know we have to we have to err on the side of caution and test the guns to this f level that we s expect they will never get shot to. Because the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, the way we test guns, no person 
will put their gun through that. The only time that gun's going to go through something similar is if it's in a rental counter right at, at a gun range. And yeah. we have a lot of guns in rental ca cabinets and and gun ranges and they perform exactly as we expect them to. But then again, those guns are being shot you know, 100, 150 rounds, and then they're back in the case for two, three, four hours. Mm -hmm. You know, on a test range, they're being shot 400 round cycles, maybe, or maybe not that many, but they're being shot a lot, thrown onto a cooling fixture, cold, cooled down as fast as they can go, and then they pick it up and go right back in it. That's all day Yeah, long, that's ridiculous. 14 hours a day. And so we, we're, we're testing to and, and this is this is a true statement, unrealistic standards, but that's the standard that we have to meet to make sure that we accommodate 100% of the customer base because there's always going to be that one person that's going to want to shoot their gun until it turns red and that kind of thing. So we have to <laughs> kind of accommodate for that or until the sights burn out on it or something like that. For so that, For that um, YouTuber guy who yes. got 10,000 rounds and lots of time. So everything <laughs> we do, everything we do, like this compensator, we had to shoot it to the point of of... of no return. You know, we talked about maybe porting the barrels. You know, we de actually did talk about that because we know b barrel ports work pretty well, but they shave brass. They can cause a lot of um, fragments coming up through them. They're hard to they're hard to make. They're expensive to make. And, you know, we also have to do stuck in, you know, stuck bore testing where we oh, put wow. a bullet in the bore and we blow the guns up to make sure, yeah, you know, what, they're not dangerous. You're destroying these guns, but you want to see what happens. Of the guns we test, we destroy a lot of them because wow. we have to make sure they'll hold up to certain pressures. We have to make sure that when the bullet stuck here or when the bullet stuck here. Oh yeah. Further down the, the barrel, barrels, whatever. Yeah. Oh wow. You don't know where the bullet's going to be stuck. So we have sure. to test all of that. Jeez. And porting of barrels sometimes can cause um, problems. So it, it's it. fair to say uh, porting a barrel can weaken the barrel. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you're, it, you're cutting holes in a barrel. Right. You're, you're <laughs> creating points where it can crack. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, when that SAS first came out, the 365 SAS, which mm -hmm. you know, has been still incredibly popular pistol, we started that gun off with a ported barrel, two ports in the barrel. And we did a lot of, a lot of work. Those ports did not start out that way. They started out a lot different. And test after test after test we finally found a way we could make the holes make the barrel stand up to any stuck billet test and so it took a lot of work and everything we do takes work and you know we if we come up with an idea if 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 product management comes up with an idea and says hey i think we should do this if it's anything outside of the realm of what we've already made as far as barrel length or slide weight or uh, magazine capacity mm -hmm. or anything like that we may come up with the idea in 2019, but we may not launch till 20 late 2020 because of the testing. Yeah, it's just going right. to take that long to do all the testing that's required. Yeah. Well, along those lines, I don't know, I don't know if you can tell tell the audience this or what, but you were you were commenting yesterday about uh, customer returned guns mm -hmm. and um, and I guess you know. A gun that's you know you just have very low customer returns on and that's the 365 yes our 365 that the 365 model is one of our most well one of our most one of our least return guns it has the lowest return percentage of any pistol we make and hmm. a, lot, a lot of people don't realize that the problem is is you know look sig is a company that we have a very ambitious boss you know? Yes, <laughs> and he's a, he's a great leader, and he has uh he has his eyes are to the horizon, and they never come off. And he wants to be the be the biggest and best company. And I feel like we've gotten there. I, I think I I wouldn't work for any other company in this industry besides Sig. So I am super excited about it uh, to work for this company. But when you're at that level, when you're making the 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 best pistols or the best affordable pistols you you can buy and uh you know you're in the optics game and you're in the ammo game mm -hmm. and you're making suppressors and rifles and now we're in the bulk game uh the bulk gun game and you know we're in the machine gun game oh, yeah? you know, we're, we're we're not just a commercial company when you're doing all that and you're at the pinnacle of success there's a lot of lights on you mm -hmm. a lot of lights flashing oh yeah and for sure looking at you and unfortunately on the 365 when we created that new market it wasn't a secret everyone knew we had something special and especially our competitors and when our when we come up with something really really cool and really really special like the 320 or the 365 mm -hmm. or the mcx or the cross there there is a 
spotlight on that product. And that's what happened with the 365. You know, we, we, um, a lot of people don't know this, but on our first uh, 1,100 or 1,200 guns we shipped, we uh, had a part that was from one of our vendors, and this vendor had just set up its cooling fixtures in its new facility in the U.S., and they had set them up wrong, and the striker, in this part, in this case, the cooling had not gone correctly, and the, some of the strikers, a very small amount of them, um, they became brittle. Okay. But we had no way of knowing which parts were in which so we we purged everything uh, once we found out about it yeah you figured out what what lot right or how many but of those you know 1100 1200 guns that shipped you know we had we had a pretty high return rate for what we typically would see i think we had like 120 130 guns return so that's for us that's really high mm -hmm. and that's very noticed because we don't get that many guns returned yeah. and of course that being the, the initial launch of the gun created a lot of buzz around the 365, not the good kind of buzz. Yeah. Especially with a gun that new. But, you know, obviously we've said this a hundred times before, SIG is a continuous improvement company. And believe it or not, we do listen to our customers and we are continuously making the guns better and better and better as we go. Not to say we're using people as a test bed or anything, because that's not the case at all. We just got unlucky with a part and we were able to fix it very, very quickly. But over the course of that, you know, we've had a gun that's been incredibly successful and been returned less than, uh, you know, a tenth of a percent Wow. Of returns. Yeah. I mean, that's that's unheard of. And and, and that's over two million guns we've shipped. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty dang good. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. Um, more. We can't talk about all the new stuff, but just to tease a little bit mm. for for the fans out there. Um, new stuff on the way. More new stuff coming yes. very soon from SIG. Yes. One one we've kind of leaked already. Um, we leaked it at the virtual SHOT Show last year. Okay. And this is another one of those instances where we, when we talk about testing and how far we go with it, uh, we were going to launch uh, the 365 380. Mm -mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually launching very, very soon. In fact, it might be launching by the time this podcast goes live. Maybe. We'll see. But um, that was an ex a perfect example of, hey, we had a gun, um, and when we were going to launch this pistol, uh, we were pretty prepared to do it. Um, we, we knew it was going to be in the next, we knew we were going to be going through testing in the next, you know, probably three weeks. We we're going to finish up testing maybe four weeks. And we were confident to, we could, that we could announce the gun. Well, then the market went completely insane. Yeah. Um, and we couldn't build guns fast enough to keep up with the demand. So it's everybody. At, yeah. It everybody was, everyone, was like, look, we can't make new can't stuff. Make Why new would guns? we? <laughs> I can't do that. So, um, we, we, People were little, literally angry at companies when they brought out new stuff in right. the past year and a half. They're like, what the hell? Just right. build more of this. You know, just build your existing stuff. I can't get anything, whether it's ammo or guns or whatever. Right. And that's what happened with 380. So uh, it worked out pretty well because there, um, when we started testing shortly after that uh, that leak or that uh, it wasn't a leak, it was an intentional announcement on, on virtual shot, we got into testing and we found – uh, what we thought were issues, um, issues that, you know, the 380, let's face it, it will be, it will be a gun that's been, that has been designed for shooters with weaker hands, weaker grips and that right. kind of thing. So we had to, we changed the way we test the gun. We actually were testing oh. the guns with weaker shooters. Sure. Instead of R and D people who are pr trained professionals, we were actually intentionally putting people behind the guns that couldn't shoot. Yeah, uh, they had weak wrists and small hands and not very strong hold, hands. Hold the gun loosely, <laughs> right? They hold the guns away. Some of our customers in that you know that base of customers will hold it, and it created some issues, some problems. So we actually did. We had to find a way to overcome those problems. So it was a blessing in disguise, really. I mean, not that we would have launched it anyway. We we would have found those. Um, we would have found those problems to begin with, but because of the market and because we found them, you know, a few weeks after the initial, you know, announcement, it worked out pretty well. And now we have a product that we are 100%, you know, uh, happy with. We couldn't be more confident in how the how it's working, and um, and it's and you're going to see it pretty soon. It's pretty cool, and we did make a few little changes to it to make it more appealing. Okay, um, so it's a P365. It's chambered in 380 ACP, so you're going to have um, less recoil, but it's not simply a new chambering. You, you have done a few diff different things yes, for this guy. Yeah, we we've lightened it quite. Uh, we've lightened it significantly. Um, I think it's a. Let me see if I do my math really fast. This is where Ron Cohen makes fun of me. It's a 20% reduction in weight 
uh, overall the weight. Gun the gun is lighter. Yeah, the gun's lighter. Um, the slide is easier to rack. And of course, it's a 380, so there's less recoil. It's easy, and, 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 you, and you have to change the spring out. Yes. And that's yeah, to make it run properly with that new caliber. Right. And it makes it easier, right. easier to rack. And the barrel's got to be smaller, a little bit smaller. And this recoil guide rod's got to be. So it has unique parts. The magazine has to be unique. Mm -hmm. um, now, we did use the same lower half. But the magazine, we had to make some interesting changes to the mag um, to make it run the way we wanted it to run. But, uh, yeah, the gun shoots really, really well. It's a 380, and it's not a disposable 380. You see a lot of 380s that are so small, you know, these 10, 11-ounce 380s. Yeah. Uh, and they're disposable guns. That's what they are. I mean, they're going to they, – if we were to put one of those guns through our testing regiment, what we hold our guns accountable for, it wouldn't. they wouldn't last. Yeah. So we had to have – we wanted to come up with a pistol that we knew was easy to shoot, easy to manipulate the slide, had a lot of features on it, which this one does, and we wanted to make sure that the gun lasted like every other Sig Sauer. We, we pushed this gun to the limits, and and that gun will find its way into rental cabinets and ranges across the country, and we know it'll last. One of the things you guys did on this is – tell me if I'm right on this – all of these new – 365 380s are optics ready they are they are which they're, is cool they're optics ready it's twofold so the optic plate is actually polymer it's plastic um, because we had to save weight and cutting that metal out of the slide actually gave us some more weight savings so this this slide is it looks normal um in fact it's so normal looking it is a, dimensionally it's a little bit different than the standard nine millimeter but it will still fit in 365 holster so you don't okay. lose holster compatibility um and uh, it is significantly lighter on the inside of the slide. You can actually see all the lightning cuts we did to make it, to make it work and make it more reliable. And, uh, it was, you know, and, and optic readiness was a bonus of that because we wanted yeah. to make it, uh, valuable. We want to have, we wanted some value adds to the gun because we didn't want, we don't, we don't, we didn't want to sign on to this idea of you make a nine millimeter like this and it's $400 and you make a 380 that's basically the same gun and it's. 350 why why is it cheap why yeah uh, so um and and the i think it's a lot to do with the perception of 380 380s have typically been cheaply made inexpensive disposable guns mm -hmm. and we're going to try to shift away from that we want this gun we want people to have as much confidence in the 380 that they would have in any other pistol from six hour and we built it for that and i love shooting 380s that are i would call it that um mid-size gun they're not tiny right it's not a it's not a, a full-size pistol but they're a pleasure to shoot they're they make fun. a lot of noise but they don't do anything yeah and the, the and the thing is noisy cricket yeah i mean it it with good ammo um i like how we went right back to men in black we got that in yeah. twice um with good ammo 380 uh is very effective as a defensive round so yeah um phil thanks for being with us man i'm happy fun. i could do it it yeah. Fun. So there you go, guys. A uh, little behind the scenes of the story of the P365 and uh, Phil's ri rise to, I don't know, trainer extraordinaire. Yeah, no, just, you know, office guy, the office guy. Yeah. All right. That's it for us. We'll see you next time on Gun Talk Nation.